is a very complex field, and these are my disclosures. Um, so I just want to walk you through a little bit of the complexity of how what we have to deal with and, and how that um, influences the combinations that we take into the clinic. So um, just, just sort of look at it this way, and I present the same slide when I present to other physicians. Um, all of you have individual a genetic makeup. <clears throat> and during the course of, of, of someone's life, you've been exposed to multiple environmental um, um, it, products, um, um, and that's, that's sort of uh, resulted in your having, um, uh, so this is bacteria, this is all sorts of things, infections, viruses, um, and so that means that every individual probably has a somewhat unique ability to recognize antigens, and what that means is that some may have memory cells for certain things, may not for of others, but, but, but every individual is somewhat unique. Um, and then at some point in the course of someone's lifetime, they develop a cancer, um, and that cancer is different in every individual because it has different mutations, um, different uh, types of gene expression, and this cancer develops in the context often of chronic inflammation. So that doesn't mean that the immune system hasn't recognized it, as you've heard about before. The cancer sometimes is aided uh, in its development by actually by an inflammatory response, by the fact that you have inflammation. Um, and during this time, you get this host tumor relationship, so your body develops this immune response against the cancer, and it, it develops this, this, uh, this relationship over time. The tumor continues to evolve, it has new mutations, the, the, the tumor spreads to other parts of the body, and that's when we see somebody in the clinic for treatment. So, so at that point, it's very different than a mouse model. When you see people present mouse experiments, they take a mouse tumor and they put it in the mouse and they treat it two days later. But when we see a patient in the clinic, they've had their cancer for 10 or 15 years or for a very long time. So that host tumor relationship is very different than what we see in a mouse model. So what that means is that mouse models help, but they don't really help because they don't really completely reproduce what's going on in a patient that we see in the clinic. And every patient we see in the clinic is different. And so in mouse models, it's very homogeneous. You have one tumor in 10 mice. All the mice have the same genetics. Every human is, is, is quite different. So we're supposed to make a choice about how to treat an individual based on this very complex biology and this, the, what's in their tumor microenvironment and this, their, their, their immune response, which we really can't identify very well when we see them in the clinic. And so when we try and make a decision about what combinations or what drugs to give, we have to consider if we were going to be really smart about this, what T cells they have in the tumor, how many T cells they have, what, what antigens they're recognizing, how many antigens they're recognizing, how, how, how strong that, that T cell recognizes those antigens, and then what the state of those lymphocytes are, because there can be many different states. You can have a healthy T cell and you can have a sick T cell, um, or, and, and things in between. Um, and then there are things that the tumors are doing to block that immune response, which could include keeping the T cells out of the tumor, or it could be that it's doing something to turn that T cell off. Um, and that could involve either things that the tumor produces, or it could involve um, sort of uh, what we call ligand receptor interactions, which is something on the surface of the tumor binding to something on the surface of the T cell that, that, that triggers it in a bad way, turns, makes it stop working the way it's supposed to. And finally, there. There are other cells, so a tumor is not just a tumor cell and lymphocytes, there are lots of other cells in there, and those cells, including blood vessels, can influence what that immune response is going to look like. And so we have this very complex mix of things, and, and, and every tumor in the body could look a little bit differently. In fact, we've, we've documented this. Our, our, our scientists have actually looked at the T cell repertoire, and even though the, the mutations may be very similar between different tumors, the T cells that are in there and what they recognize may be very different from one tumor to the next. So from all of this, we're supposed to be very smart and say, you need X. And it's actually very hard to be smart when, when the biology is this complex and we we have a hard time defining it. And so um, Dr. Bramer just showed you um, sort of the simplest manifestation of this is maybe we can just look at the tumor and look at two things. Are there T cells in there and whether um, those T cells are doing something and whether this marker PDL1 is up? And that tells us, gives us some information, but as I already showed you, there's a huge amount more information there that we're not 
digging in. But I show you this, this slide here specifically. Um, I know that uh, um, just to make the point that um, I'm not sure this is working, but to make the point that um, when somebody comes in with melanoma, their tumors could look, and this is just looking at two variables, very differently. This one has no lymphocytes in it. Um, this one has no lymphocytes in it. This one has pdl one expression, but, but that may not mean anything. This one has lymphocytes that are in there that are ready to go. They're making cytokines. Uh, pdl one is up. And this one has lymphocytes in it, but they don't seem to be doing anything. They, they may not even be recognizing any tumor antigens. They just be bystanders. And the percentages of patients that, that have these different subtypes are different between lung cancer and between melanoma. And this data was actually generated by one of Dr. Bramer's colleague, Janice Taubet, at, 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 uh, at, at Johns Hopkins. So um, then the, the next question is, is how, how actually does all this work? And you heard about this before that in the simplest context, there, there are ways that we can intervene, for example, at the level of antigen presentation. So you've heard that in order to get a T cell activated, you have to get a, the, the antigen has to be presented. It's actually a little piece of the protein that's actually put on the surface of a cell that's recognized by this T cell receptor. And then there are co-stimulatory signals, or things that, that sort of help trigger the T cell. But when the T cell gets triggered, there are these feedback mechanisms. And that's also very complex. So the um, you, you, you can't just turn on an immune system, right, and not, not have it continue to be on. It has to turn off. When you have a virus and you're done clearing the virus, your immune system has to turn off, otherwise you get sick, and there are molecular mechanisms that control this. And so this, this, this thing, CTLA-4, comes onto the surface of the cell, and this interaction between CTLA-4 and this, this thing called B7 actually stops the T cell from proliferating. And when you get into the tumor, there are other ways of sort of blocking T cell function. And in this case, the T cell gets in and it sees its antigen. It gets all revved up and starts making cytokines to try and, and influence what's happening to the tumor, maybe even try and killing it. But the things that it's, that's turned on to do also cause the tumor to upregulate defense mechanisms. And this defense mechanism is upregulation of the PDL1, which then binds to PD1, which sits on the surface of the T cell. And this interaction basically inactivates the T cell. So then it stops making cytokines, can't kill anymore. So you see that there are ways of activating these T cells and also ways of turning it off. And there are natural mechanisms that turn off the immune response. So when we try and give something, there are things that, that, that fight back. Um, so we try and turn something on, there's things that dampen that, that, that activation. Um, and so how complicated is this? I'm, you're not, um, I'm giving a test, actually, at the end of this talk. And <laughs> all of you are supposed to be able to answer the questions correctly. <laughs> so the point of showing this slide is not for you to, um, to understand um, the individual components, but just to understand how complicated the biology is and why we have an infinite number of combinations that we can use. Because um, you can see here that the, these interactions that occur between things that present antigen to T cells and the T cells themselves, and this is also true between the tumor and the T cell, there are all these things that can turn on the T cell and all these things that can turn off the T cell, right? And, and it's not an analog system. It's, it's not a digital system. It's an analog system. And so um, it may be that um, a lot of one and a little bit of another is enough, or, or maybe if you have a lot of one but a lot of inhibitory substances, it doesn't turn on. So this is a very complex interaction, and we actually don't know how to integrate all this information when we see it uh, in the tumor microenvironment. And there are yet other inhibitory factors, so substances that are produced by T cells and, 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 and even things like lack of oxygen within the tumor microenvironment can turn the T cells off. And in fact, it turns out that T cells and the tumors compete for things like glucose, and that can be an important uh, inhibitory factor for, for the lymphocytes there. And so, for example, every tumor might be a little bit different. When we look in melanoma, we see that these checkpoints are expressed at, at fairly high levels, but that may not be true in every tumor. So again, it just sort of uh, it illustrates the complexity of this. Now, um, in terms of turning T cells off, I, again, I just want to just point out that there are um, uh, generally, there's not one off switch. So if the T cells in the tumor, I've showed you that there are multiple off switches. And this is data that's going to be actually presented here by, by one of Dr. Rosenberg's fellows showing that when you take a T cell out of a melanoma tumor, 
it expresses usually more than one off switch. So we're just using PD-1. We're just sort of blocking one off switch, but those T cells may have multiple off switches. And one of the reasons why our treatments may not work is that there are two or three off switches. And in order to get this T cell to sort of get above that threshold of activation, we may need to block two or three off switches in order to get the best effect. But we actually don't know which ones are the ones that are critical to, to, to block at this point in time. We have animal model data, but whether that actually um, translates into, um, uh, in, into what happens in a human, as I told you, may or may not be the case. So here's, again, another very complex slide, but just to get, give you an idea of all the different things that we can do today. So um, there are things like TGF-beta, which is a cytokine, which actually can, can block uh, uh, or inhibit T cell function. There are other cells within the tumor that can produce substances or directly block um, T cell function. There's the lack of oxygen, and there are, are products that can actually, um, the, when, when, you, when, you have, when you don't have a lot of oxygen in the tumor, you can make this substance called adenosine, and adenosine can bind to T cells and sort of dampen the way the T cell gets activated. And now we have inhibitors of that, and that may reverse the effects of hypoxia. Um, um, we have a bunch of other of what we call these checkpoint inhibitors, these off switches on the T cells. Uh, some of these off switches may actually be on other cells within the microenvironment. So we can, one of the things that we can do is we can sort of pick one of these sort of negative regulatory factors and block them or block multiple ones at the same time. Or at the same time, we could actually give agents that can nonspecifically activate cells in the, in the, in the tumor or we can actually take cells out of the tumor and grow them to very large numbers, and if they're angin-specific, we can give them back combined with one of these things. And, and down here, um, we can give, like we used to do before, cytokines. So there's, there's, there's lots of different things that we can do, and w the point that I've always tried to make is that when any individual person comes to see us, I showed you how complex the biology is. I can't tell what signals they need in order to turn their T cells on into the tumor, and there's a sort of an infinite number of potential combinations. And it's not that there may be one right combination, there may be 10 right combinations, but I still don't know which of the 10 I'm, I need to use in that individual. Um, so let me give you some examples of things that, that, that have worked. Um, and, and you've heard about this before. So this is data from Alan Corman, and these are just two of these off switches. One is CTLA-4 and one is PD-1, and they work in different places in the way T cells are activated. And they probably do many different things. For example, when you block CTLA-4, um, not only do you sort of block an off switch, but you also kill bad cells in the tumor. And for, in ways that we don't really understand, you can drive cells, T cells, into the tumor. There's somehow or another, it, it, it changes the ability of T cells perhaps to migrate into the tumor. But we really don't understand the biology. And PD-1, you've heard about. And when we, when we block PD-1, we block one of these off switches. And so it just made sense because these were the first two agents that came to the clinic to combine them together. And when they did these mouse model data, if you give one of them, you don't see much activity. But if you give the two together, you see this, this almost synergistic anti-tumor activity. So it was a no-brainer to just combine the two uh, in the clinic. And to make a very long story short, we did this trial together with Dr. Wolchuk at Memorial Stone Kettering, and Dr. Atkins participated, and so did the University of Pittsburgh. And among the first 53 patients, we, we saw a two-year survival in overall melanoma that we've never seen before. It was nearly 80%. So if, if we were to look um, 20 years ago and uh, look at the two-year survival of patients with melanoma, it would be down here around 20%, maybe. And with ipilimumab, just one of these drugs, it would be somewhere around 30 to 35%. If we give anti-PD-1 alone, it could be maybe in the 50%, 50 to 60% range with, with, with just anti-PD-1 alone. But when we gave the combination, we saw this two-year overall survival. Now, let me make this point. This is in a phase one trial with patients that are put on at two institutions. And whenever somebody, uh, you read something in the news media, or even we put it out, and we say, we've extended survival in a phase one trial, you should immediately look at that and say, they're trying to fool me or they're lying to me. Because we don't know that when we see a two-year overall survival of 80 percent in 53 patients, whether that's a real number or that could just be chance selection of patients that we put on the trial. So the only way we know whether this is real or not is, unfortunately, to do a randomized trial. That's the only way we know. The only way we could know that this is real is, in fact, 
if, 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 if anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 by themselves only gave a 30% to your survival, this difference would be so huge that we'd know for sure that we would have done something special. But when anti-PD-1 by itself gives you a pretty good to your survival, this increment of about 20% could easily be due to chance alone in the patients we put on the study. But there are other data that we can use to tell us that, that might be interesting. So this is, uh, these are investigators from, um, from our institution who looked at patients who had gotten anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 alone in the combination, and they did something very simple. They just looked at gene expansion in T cells in the peripheral blood. So it's just looking to see whether we've changed the T cells at all. And what it turns out is when you give anti-PD-1 alone, you have certain changes in the T cells. When you give anti-CTLA-4, you have certain changes. But when you do give the two together, it's like giving a different drug. You, you do something to the T cells that, that's, that's not expected from either agent alone. Because you have all these new genes that are being expressed. And so that gives us some confidence that the combination really is different than the, than the single agents. And this was ultimately uh, was put to a randomized trial. And you heard about it from, from Julie and others. And when we compared the combination to anti-PD-1 alone, this is nivolumab or to ipilimumab alone, this is looking at progression-free survival, which means how long, it, how long it takes from the start of treatment until we see something change in, in a bad way on the, on the CT scans. And it looked as though the patients who got the combination did better, it took longer for them to progress, than patients who got nivolumab alone or, um, uh, or ipilimumab alone. Um, now, that's not just true in melanoma. It seems to be true in... In, in kidney cancer, because in kidney cancer, when this combination was looked at um, by uh, and reported by Hammers from Johns Hopkins, um, it looked like the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab also gave a higher response rate in kidney cancer. Now, this was also subjected to a randomized trial. We'll have to wait a year or two to see what those results uh, show. But at least in two different diseases now, we're seeing activity of the combination that seems to be better than the single agent alone. And this is even a third disease. This is small cell lung cancer, and this is very preliminary data with a small number of patients, but again suggesting that the combination, and now this is overall survival, looks better than just anti-PD-1 alone. So now in at least three different tumors, we, we believe that the combination is looking better than the single agents. Um, so this is an example of a combination that was put together. It appeared to be rational. It was the first combination. So this was sort of low-hanging fruit. But from now on, knowing what combinations to use and knowing how to, how to move forward from this setting is going to be very, very difficult. Here's another example of a combination that we're very excited about, and it's based a little bit on biology. So it turns out that tumors that, that, that have a lot of this, this substance called VEGF, which is a growth factor for blood vessels, tend to exclude T cells from the microenvironment. So we've shown this, and other people have shown this. And so Genentech ran a trial combining their anti pd one it's like anti-PD-1, with this common drug called bevacizumab, which blocks this VEGF growth factor, which, which blocks this growth factor that, that, that helps to form blood vessels. And when we did that study, and we did biopsies before and after, and this is why it's so important to do biopsies in clinical trials, even though it's inconvenient and painful for, for individual patients, we learned that just a bevacizumab alone could drive lymphocytes into the tumor. And that's a very important finding because that means that maybe we can use this combination to treat patients who don't have a lot of lymphocytes in their tumor to begin with. Because anti-PD-1 won't drive those cells in. You need something else, and maybe uh, bevacizumab would do that. And actually, they corroborated this by looking at chemokines. These are substances that are produced by the tumors that can draw in T cells. And when you gave the bevacizumab, you saw an increase in the number of chemokines, these, these T cell attractants that were being produced within the tumor microenvironment. And so now there are randomized trials that are uh, comparing bevacizumab at anti pdl one to anti pdl one alone, and actually to a standard of care like, like SUTEN in patients with kidney cancer. And we hope those results will be positive. So there are lots of other ways that other we can combine with immune therapy. Um, and so um, uh, a lot of people are interested in combining radiation or chemotherapy or targeted therapies. These are things that, that, that don't work through the immune system, or at least we don't think so directly. We think that their effect is directly on the tumor cell, although certainly these substances can also have effect on immune cells. But when you look at the reasons why one might do, do, do sort of non-immune therapies with immune therapies, you might want to maybe reduce the amount of tumor that's there so you get more T cells 
per tumor cell so that you sort of get you know, better odds uh, to kill the tumor cell. Um, it may be that killing the tumor cell in different ways, with the way the chemotherapy kills it or the way the T cell kills it, might be synergistic. It might kill the tumor cell better. It could be that when we give the chemotherapy, these, these, these substances that are made by the tumor, which turn off the T cells, could be reduced by the chemotherapy. Or maybe just giving the chemotherapy or the radiation or the targeted therapies sort of break down these barriers to lymphocytes so that the lymphocytes can get into the tumor. So there are lots of reasons why combining what we call traditional treatment with immune therapies might actually be additive or synergistic. And here's an example, and, and this is, uh, I think, the last point that I want to make, that we've always considered radiation therapy and chemotherapy to work just by directly killing the tumor cells. And we thought that all of the activity and efficacy was really related to direct effects on the tumor. But the fact is, is that the, the activity of even standard chemotherapy or radiation probably depends on some element of the immune system in order for it to work well. So this is an example. This is a mouse model from the University of Chicago, and it's very instructive. And, and I, you don't need to understand the slides except to, to, to understand maybe one or two of these figures, which basically show that if you give radiation, so sort of in this setting right here, the radiation is very effective in, in this mouse, which has T cells. It, it completely flatlines the tumor. That's what you want radiation to do. You want it to kill the tumor cells, and the tumor won't come back. So it turns out that when you give the radiation in this mouse, but then you get rid of the mouse lymphocytes, you, have, you give the same amount of radiation, everything is the same, except you're just getting rid of, with, with agents that we can use to get rid of the, the T lymphocytes, the tumor grows back. So what that means is that the effect of radiation is a combination not only of the direct effects of the radiation on the tumor cell, but in order for the radiation to really control that, that tumor, your immune system has to kick in. And, and, and be active in that process. And if you get rid of your immune system, if you don't have immunity against your cancer, the tumor will just grow back. So when we give chemotherapy and radiation and targeted therapies, part of that effect is really something that your own body is doing, your own immune system is doing to control the, the, the cancer. So um, this is just a partial list of the innumerable number of combinations that are ongoing today. This is. PD-1 combinations, these are CTLA-4 combinations, with almost anything that you can imagine, chemotherapy, radiation, vaccines, cytokines, co-stimulatory molecules, checkpoint inhibitors, it's innumerable. And I don't think any of us can tell you which of these are going to be the winners. <laughs> and in fact, what's even more complicated is they may all be winners, but they may all be winners in small subsets of patients. And the challenge for us as physicians in the future is to be able to say, um, Mrs. Smith needs IL-2 and PD-L1, but um, um, Mr. Um, uh, Jones needs anti-CD37 plus anti-PD-1. That's what we need to be able to do, and at the moment, we're not able to do that well. And it may not be PD-1. It may be that it's CTLA-4, another agent in combination with, say, something like interferon that may be right for that individual. And that, I think, is the, the, the challenge and the very difficult challenge to advance the field from where we are uh, today. So. Um, in conclusion, we've, we've identified lots of things that influence anti-tumor responses, but it's difficult to define um, in, in, in any individual patient. It, it's difficult to understand the, difficult, the different factors and their relative importance and their relationship. And, and, and even more complicated, and this is something that Dr. Bramer, I think, mentioned also, is that once we make an intervention, things happen, and we don't, we don't know how to measure that. So those things that change may be good or may be bad, and we need to be able to know what factors may be induced that maybe block that response, so we maybe add to something in even after we start the, the treatment. There are lots of interesting combinations, but at the moment, it's e even we have a very difficult time understanding what the right ratio of the drugs is or the right sequence, um, and, and that can influence activity. Um, and, and as I told you, it's not clear when we do these combinations that we're matching the combination to the right patient. We don't have that technology yet. And that's something that needs to be supported. A lot of research needs to go into defining that. And, and the, the one other thing that I mentioned to you earlier is that because you often read things in the news media that are put out by companies or by academic institutions, and remember that all, all of these groups have a vested interest in advancing their therapies. And when they tell you that something happens, you shouldn't necessarily believe that it's true. Because lots of claims are made in the media and in news releases that claim that some therapy works or some therapy is better than some other therapy, but it's not based on the right trial. It's just, 
an extrapolation or a guess. And, and unless it's really clear proof data, and there's very few trials that actually definitively answer these kinds of questions, you can be, be led into thinking that something is much more promising than it really is. If I had a nickel for every single arm trial that said that they had advanced the field or made an advance in patient care that ultimately failed in phase three trials, I would already be in my retirement home in Florida. But unfortunately, <laughs> I don't get a nickel for every one of those. So again, when you, when, you, when you read the newspapers and the news media, be very skeptical of what you read. A lot of it is not, not true. So I'll stop there, and I'm happy to answer questions.